this meeting. And uh, I hope that you will now uh, have, have heard that the meeting is is being recorded. Um, this is so that we can share the uh, seminar with, with people who are on, aren't able to be here uh, the, the, in person today. We have uh, a wonderful collection of uh, people from around the world who've uh, signed up for our meeting. Um, we, we've already heard from, from Bangladesh, from, uh, from Latin America, uh, and uh, we, it, it, it's uh, a, a very international group, which is great. Um, we're an international research network on human rights education. It's a joint enterprise between UCL uh, in, in, in London, uh, where we host the ICEDC conference that uh, some of you will, will know about. Unfortunately, not able to take place this year, but um, it, it's something that we uh, are looking forward to, to hosting in 2022, but for the moment we are replacing it with this uh, s seminar series. The other uh, sponsor of the research network is um, Human Rights Education Review from the University of uh, Southern Nor Norway. The seminar series is uh, about human rights education and we are starting by uh, having presentations from people who've recently published in Human Rights Education Review. Uh, Audrey Osler, my, my colleague, will be uh, introducing the speakers, um, but just a few housekeeping things. Um, you have the chat function on, on Zoom. Um, please use the chat function to uh, ask questions uh, for the uh, for the, the speakers um, and indicate um, if you, you have a particular comment to make. Um, we hope that uh, at the end there will be plenty of time for um, question and, uh, and answer. And Audrey as chair is likely to um, look at the chat and choose uh, people who, who have put questions there and invite them to unmute and uh, ask the, the, the question themselves. For that reason, um, when you ask a question in, in the chat, um, please add your name at the end of the question because it, it isn't always obvious otherwise uh, who, who it's from. And then Audrey will be able to uh, identify you. Um, the, uh, we, we, are, we, we welcome people tweeting about this meeting. Um, in the uh, chat, you've already got the hashtag that, that we're using um, and, and some uh, Twitter handles. Um, you're also welcome, of course, to uh, tweet about the uh, event um, after the, the event uh, and say how much you enjoyed it. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to our chair for this evening, uh, Professor Audrey Osler. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me clearly. I, I say good evening, but I realize it's actually morning in, in parts of the world and, and quite late at night for some of you. We're very, very glad that we have such an international audience uh, this evening, and we welcome you very, very warmly uh, to this session. Um, tonight, today's session is, um, we're bringing you two speakers, uh, Megan Devenold, and Sylvia Guelmi, uh, who's joining us. Uh, Megan is joining us from the UK. Uh, Sylvia is joining us from Rome in Italy, and we're very pleased that they will be presenting. They are both members of the Gender and Adolescent Global Evidence uh, Group at the Overseas Development Institute in the UK. And they will be talking uh, to their recently published paper uh, that they have prepared with colleagues from George Washington University in the United States. So uh, we have a paper here from colleagues who, whose uh, affiliations are in the UK and in the US. Uh, the title of uh, this evening's presentation is Human Rights Education in Humanitarian Settings, Opportunities and Challenges. And I think that's probably why we have uh, such a global audience this evening, because this is a topic which necessarily engages us all across the world. Uh, we face uh, challenges in, in um, 
working and educating groups, both to receive refugee people, uh, to receive migrants, but also working with those migrants and refugee communities. And this evening, um, Megan and Sylvia will be talking about the actual work of human rights education in those humanitarian settings. Welcome, Sylvia, welcome, Megan, and we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. And thanks very much, Hugh. Thanks very much, Audrey. I hope you can all hear me well, and thank you for, for the audience for participating to today's uh, session. As, as Audrey stated, our, uh, our presentation is called Human Rights Education in, in Humanitarian Settings, Opportunities and Challenges. So um, if I just move, yes. Uh, I will start by presenting the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Research Program and providing a brief overview of the research we conduct um, at GAGE. We will then go into two country contexts, so Jordan and Bangladesh, and uh, look at the methodology, the context, both in terms of the country context as well as the educational offer for uh, refugees in Jordan and Bangladesh. And then we will be discussing the results and findings of our research. Uh, we will then conclude with some policy recommendations that have stemmed from our findings. So the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence, otherwise known as GAGE program, is a longitudinal mixed methods research program in low and middle income countries that spans nine years. So it was um, launched in 2015 and it will run to uh, 2024 following the same cohort of adolescents throughout those years. Um, our research is, uh, is conducted in six countries in the global south. So we're present in two countries in Africa that's Ethiopia and Rwanda, three in the Middle East, Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan, and two countries in Southeast Asia, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So uh, in these countries, we follow uh, comprehensively 20,000 adolescents and young people aged 10 to 19 years. And our research uh, sample is weighted towards vulnerable adolescents. So we, um, we are speaking and surveying adolescents with disabilities, um, young married girls, adolescent mothers, uh, adolescents that are out of school, as well as adolescent refugees, which is the topic of today's presentation. And in many of these six countries, uh, we have human. We are we are using a humanitarian lens and looking at humanitarian context. So today you'll be hearing about the Rohingya population in in Bangladesh, uh, the Syrian Syrian refugee population in Jordan. But we also um, we also in our sample we also include uh, Ethiopian internally displaced populations, Congolese refugees. So we also do a kind of cross country humanitarian research. Uh, the aim of the GAGE program is to generate new evidence on what works to support adolescent girls and boys, both um, in, in kind of advancing their capabilities now, but also as they transition into, into adulthood. And um, to underpin adolescent well-being, we use a capabilities approach, which looks at six key areas. Uh, those are education and learning, uh, bodily integrity and freedom from age and gender-based violence, in health and nutrition, psychosocial well-being, voice and agency, and economic empowerment. So human rights education in our research is very fitting, and particularly in humanitarian settings, as it provides a, um, an opportunity for adolescent refugees to advance their uh, understanding as well as exercise their human rights respect the rights of others and potentially gain active citizenship skills. So the extent to which these human rights education programs are successful um, is, is kind of the scope of our research. 
And finally, Audrey already mentioned, but um, just to state that the GAGE consortium is managed by the Overseas Development Institute and convenes 35 research policy and program partners globally. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Megan, and switch the slide. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, so as was previously mentioned, we're going to be um, discussing an article that was recently published in the Human Rights Education Review um, that's looking at human rights education in humanitarian settings. So we're looking at two different non-formal education programs, um, one in Jordan, which is called the Makani program, and one in Bangladesh, um, which are called temporary learning centers. Um, so both me and Sylvia will go into a little bit more detail about these two programs um, later in the presentation. Um, we're focusing on two different populations. So in Jordan, um, Syrian refugees, and in Bangladesh, um, Rohingya refugees. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So for the analysis in the paper, we um, use the UN's um, three key dimension of uh, human rights education. So about, through and for human rights. Um, so about human rights, we wanted to look at the program's content, um, whether they provided understandings of um, human rights principles and values um, through human rights, um, ensuring that the way that these programs were taught um, were aligned with the principles of human rights. And then finally looking for human rights, so whether these programs ultimately um, ended up in the empowerment of participants so that they could access their rights and respect the rights of others. We wanted to use uh, this kind of framework because we wanted to take a more multi-dimensional approach and look at not just the content of these programs, but also the teaching methodologies and um, in terms of empowerment of adolescents. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So I'm first going to um, quickly go over the methodology and sample um, for both Jordan and Bangladesh. So in Jordan, as I said, we're focusing on Syrian refugees with a total sample of 1,593. Um, we were looking at adolescents in three different um, location types. So those in UN refugee camps, um, informal tented settlements, and host communities. And these were across a wide range of locations in Jordan, and Maverick and Erevid. We conducted both quantitative and qualitative um, research for this article. For the quantitative, we um, focused on 10 to 14 year old adolescent boys and girls. For the qualitative, we focused on 10 to 14 um, adolescent boys and girls, and also um, focused on some old adolescents as well, aged 15 to 18. We used a range of um, participatory methods um, in the qualitative um, interviews, both um, individual interviews and focus group discussions um, using more interactive methods, um, such as um, for some of the focus groups um, with Makani um, participants, um, we conducted interviews using a tool called uh, Most Significant Change, um, where adolescents in the groups were asked to rank various um, components of the programme in terms of what had the most um, impact on them. Um, so as Sylvia mentioned before, we also include um, a subsample of um, adolescents that have disabilities um, and married adolescents. So in Jordan, this is made up 10% and 5% of the sample. Could I have the next slide? So in Bangladesh, um, we were focusing on Rohingya refugees, the total sample of 608. Um, we were looking at 32 different um, refugee camps across Cox's Bazaar. There are actually um, 34 um, refugee camps in Cox's Bazaar, um, but two of these refugee camps um, include Rohingya refugees um, 
that have come in previous waves um, and their more established camps. Um, we wanted to focus on um, Rohingya refugees that had come in 2017, um, as these are refugees that are unregistered um, and highly vulnerable. So again, we conducted quantitative uh, research with 10 to 14 year olds and qualitative um, research with 10 to 14 year olds and, and 15 to 18 year olds. Um, we conducted interviews with adolescents, but then also with their parents um, and key informants, um, including facilitators of the programme. Again, um, including adolescents with disabilities um, and married adolescents. Could I have the next slide? So I'll go through some of um, the context and, um, and some of the key findings for Jordan, and then I'll pass you back over to Sylvia, who will be going over the Bangladesh findings. So Jordan has a really long history of hosting um, refugees. It um, has the second highest proportion of refugees in comparison to its um, total population. Um, so it's just after Lebanon. Um, and Syrian refugees have been in Jordan for about a decade. Um, so the majority came since 2011 um, during the Syrian um, conflict. So as Jordan has been um, hosting a significant number of refugees, um, it's faced quite a lot of economic and social challenges. However, in recent years, it's really expanded its educational opportunities um, for refugees. And they can now um, attend formal schooling um, through a nationwide double shift system. Um, so Jordanians attend school in the morning and then Syrians attend school in the afternoon. They also have access to the non-formal education program, um, Makani. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so I will do a little overview of the Makani program. Um, it's a UNICEF Rome program, and it's um, been running in Jordan since 2015. It provides non-formal tuition, um, life skills, and child protection services, and reaches around 200,000 vulnerable um, refugee and host community children and adolescents um, from the ages um, of zero to 18 years. So human rights is really embedded within the programme. Um, it teaches concepts of child's rights. Um, and it ensures that staff not only promote, but respect human rights. It also provides community outreach sessions um, and parenting classes um, to the wider community. Facilitators of the programme are both Jordanian and Syrian, and they're from the local community. Um, and they've been provided with really in-depth training on child protection. Um, um, and they've all been um, assigned to um, sign the um, Child Protection Code of Conduct. Can I have the next slide? So in terms of our key findings um, for Jordan, we found that um, it really does have a child rights-centered um, approach in the content, there's substantial um, content that focuses on different aspects of human rights, um, particularly the right to be free from violence um, is taught in child protection classes. So multiple adolescents um, in our interviews um, highlighted the fact that they were taught about the differences um, between psychological, um, physical and sexual violence um, and the importance of um, reporting these, uh, this violence to a trusted adult. Um, so this was reflected in the quantitative data. Um, we found that 48% of Makani attendees know where to seek support if they experience violence, um, compared to 39% of those that don't attend. We also found in the um, qualitative research that there 
were a number of adolescents that um, after attending these child protection um, classes um, reported um, their own experiences of um, violence or sexual harassment to Makani facilitators. Um, they were then able to refer them on to services. There's also a um, strong focus on child marriage um, at Makani, um, which is pr uh, particularly important uh, due to the high rates of child marriage, um, particularly within Syrian refugees. So um, Makani um, is involved in lots of um, participatory methods, including role plays where adolescents discuss the various risks of getting married early. I have the next slide. Thank you. Um, within the teaching methodology, um, the approach that Makani take is also um, highly aligned with um, human rights values. Fun. So it tends to use um, more open dialogue um, and interactive forms of teaching. Um, and this is in quite a strong contrast um, to the more authoritarian style of um, teaching in formal schooling, um, where informal schooling teachers tend to rely a lot on corporal punishment um, and the teaching is quite unidirectional. So this was something that adolescents really valued at Makani. Um, multiple adolescents um, highlighted that they really valued the opportunity to um, discuss and have open dialogues with um, facilitators at Makani. Um, the programme we also found encouraged social cohesion between different groups of adolescents, um, particularly between refugee adolescents and host community um, Jordanian um, students. So there was a lot of activities where um, they would kind of work together um, and kind of learn about um, each other in that way. Um, there was also opportunities to interact with people with disabilities um, and participants highlighted that um, through this they were learning about um, the importance of inclusion. Could I have the next slide? Um, so in terms of the Final pillar, so looking at um, human uh, rights for um, whether it um, ultimately resulted in adolescents um, being empowered and being able to access um, their own human rights and respect the rights of others. Um, we found less direct um, um, examples of this. Um, however, in the social innovation labs, um, older adolescents were involved in creatively coming up with um, solutions to problems in the community. Um, so they had to think of certain issues they wanted to tackle um, and think of ways um, to um, tackle these challenges. So in this way, they were um, involved in contributing to their communities and learned about the importance of volunteering and gained um, leadership skills. Additionally, um, Makani adolescents um, highlighted that um, they gained a lot of self-confidence in partaking in um, Makani. And this was also seen in the quantitative data um, where 6% of Makani participants um, feel comfortable expressing their opinions to older people um, compared to only 65% of non-participants. Um, so even though these skills are less directly linked to human rights, um, they still can provide the more wider skills that are important in adolescents um, being able to access their own human rights. Um, we saw um, examples where adolescents said that they now felt more confident to be able to um, challenge their parents if um, they wanted to get them married early or, um, or wanted to um, make them leave school early as well. Um, yeah, I will pass you on to Sylvia now, who will be talking about the Bangladesh fundings. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Megan. 
Um, so the Bangladesh context, um, a very different, very different context, of course. Um, it is the fastest growing emergency in the world. At the moment, approximately 860,000 Rohingya refugees are displaced in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, which is one of, uh, one of the country's poorest regions. Uh, approximately 23% of, of Rohingya refugees are adolescent girls and boys aged 10 to 19. So uh, quite uniquely, uh, not much is known about uh, Rohingya adolescent refugees predating their displacement in Bangladesh uh, due to a history of exclusion where the Rohingya um, have been marginalized and um, frequently not counted in, in survey data in Myanmar. Very little is known about their socio-demographic characteristics um, and they are also a stateless population. So um, kind of compounding their marginalization, the Rohingya, the new wave, the sort of 2017 wave of the, of, of the Rohingya in Bangladesh lack legal refugee status. So they are in a sort of legal and humanitarian limbo where they are um, safe and hosted, but they lack um, protection and other, other benefits that come with refugee status as we know. Um, moreover, the limited capacity and political will to absorb the Rohingya into host community structures and into um, education systems, national education systems, means that they are excluded from host community schools. Um, and again, just to reiterate that Cox's Bazar is one of the most impoverished regions in, in, in Bangladesh, so they are facing very strained uh, resources. So uh, temporary learning centers is um, what uh, is the sort of educational, non-formal educational offer in Rohingya camps. And uh, temporary learning centers are uh, established by the government of Bangladesh, as well as education, humanitarian sector partners and lead agencies, Save the Children and UNICEF. Uh, so just very quickly to give a, ba a bit of background, the, uh, this initial sort of uh, wave began in the summer of 2017, where in one month alone, about 560,000 Rohingya crossed the border into Bangladesh. So the magnitude and the speed with which the Rohingya arrived uh, cannot be underestimated. So the initial response in 2017 really did focus on securing safe and child-friendly spaces. In 2018 and 2019, um, a new phase began, which uh, really focused on procuring quality education. And this is when the temporary learning centers were established in the camps. As part of the temporary learning centers, uh, sector partners Dr um, drafted and are continuing to expand the learning competency framework, which essentially is a tailored and um, kind of ad hoc curriculum for this population. Um, they were not able to access the Bangladeshi nor the Myanmar curriculum, so the, they, uh, the learning competency framework where it was established, um, yeah, as I say, it was a tailored syllabus. After uh, significant negotiations between Bangladesh and Myanmar, the Myanmar curriculum uh, was allowed to be, to be piloted in the camps. So the rollout of the Myanmar curriculum, which would have given the Rohingya a certification, was planned for April 2020. But of course, it has been indefinitely paused uh, due to COVID, which brought uh, educational closures in the camps, in the country, and in the world, and, um, and new priorities, obviously. So um, the two bullet points at the bottom of the screen, um, the temporary learning centers offer limited opportunity for quality education, particularly as adolescents age. 
And the educational offer is really seen to cater to young children and young, our younger cohort of adolescents. So really up to the age of 12. Um, so in terms of um, education about human rights, uh, just to state that temporary learning center facilitators, because that is what they are called, they're not sort of termed teachers, uh, to reiterate the temporary nature of, of the offer, um, do not necessarily have a teaching background, particularly the Bangladesh, Bangladeshi facilitators from host communities. And whilst teaching life skills is part and parcel of the syllabus, including uh, one's rights and duties, this has essentially translated into teaching self-care through healthy, safe choices uh, and respect for the community, again, mostly to do with young children. So this was seen as the, as the priority and this, um, this is what has been primarily taught. So a teacher has told us when I first came here, I found Rohingya pupils didn't wear shoes or didn't wash their hands. Um, and I plan to reside, resign from the job. Gradually, everything has changed and now everyone is neat and clean. So although better self-care is a very welcome change, it is limited in terms of uh, human rights education and its, its overall scope. Uh, particularly troubling, obviously, for, um, for the Rohingya, and certainly a crucial finding for our research, is that an alarming 83% of adolescents and youth aged 15 to 24 remain without access to education or skills development. So they are really a kind of left behind uh, group. To uh, fill this gap, um, NGOs have set up classes and home-based learning to teach uh, life skills, skills um, potentially for employment purposes, such as sewing and tailoring, as well as some, um, uh, some kind of tailored programs on mitigating gender, uh, gender kind of power imbalances and gender-based violence our research has found that uptake remains very low. So only about 2.4% of our older adolescents um, are sort of signing up to these programs. Also, the skills that, uh, that are taught um, are, might lead to some volunteer work and opportunities in the camps, but they are not, we cannot really claim that they are transferable skills for the outside world which essentially reinforces the fact that the Rohingya are not allowed outside of their settlements. So they, not, they cannot go, venture into, into the host communities. Uh, as one 16 year old girl uh, told us, we didn't have any chance to go to school in the host communities, we just don't go out. So what will I do? In, in terms of human rights uh, through, uh, sorry, pardon me, education through human rights, the teaching pedagogy in the temporary learning centers is perhaps the most aligned to, to um, HRE processes. Um, it is very learner centered. It mixes direct instruction with independent learning. It fosters empowerment, reflection, and teamwork, and, and instills do no harm principles. In fact, I, I would say that throughout our qualitative research, all of our adolescents that, that do attend the programs find, find it to be a very positive experience that they, they, enjoy, um, they enjoy going to, to the centers. They um, perhaps have claimed to, to gain limited knowledge. However, the experience is very positive. Um, as kind of evidence, evidence of this as well, adolescents attending the temporary learning centers are 14% and 12% respectively more likely to talk to their fathers and mothers about the bullying they may experience compared to those non-attending. So this is some, some you know, hard evidence that the teaching through human rights is, is trickling down into their daily lives. However, there are limits to how much, um, how much human rights education can really be, be, be brought in, in the classrooms and in the discussions, 
because the teachers, as opposed to what Megan was saying in the Makani program, have very limited training. So um, in the left-hand side of the screen, a teacher told us, no, I had never taught before. I had training in Chittagong, an eight-day basic training and some monthly refreshers. After one year of teaching, I had another five-day basic training. So they, um, they have refresher courses, um, and it's also not clear how long they stay in those positions. So um, this would be an interesting scope for further research. So uh, to conclude, human, you know, a comprehensive human rights educational offer does appear to be lacking in the, uh, in the Rohingya camps. The education strategy, uh, again, by spearheaded by UNICEF, Save the Children and the government of Bangladesh, does seek to foster social cohesion, uh, both by enhancing education systems in host communities, as well as including host communities uh, in, in the camps. The reality is quite different where the Rohingya remain essentially segregated from, um, from host communities and it's not clear how they are um, meant to kind of develop and foster active citizenship skills, which has been kind of crystallized by a 17 year old boy, a Rohingya boy who, who stated to us, if any country takes any step in educating us, I would go abroad. So there really is a, a gap here. Um, I'll hand back to uh, to Megan to conclude. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, so I'll go through some of the key conclusions um, and some policy recommendations that we made in the paper. Um, so as you can see, there's really um, stark differences between the integration of human rights education in both these two uh, non-formal education programs. Um, the Makani program in Jordan um, provides more of a promising practice um, in human rights education, um, particularly um, showing the value of human rights education in the humanitarian response um, within uh, fostering social cohesion um, between uh, refugee participants um, and host participants as well. Um, the Makani program was also um, beneficial in directly challenging um, some more culturally sensitive topics, um, such as child marriage and gender-based violence. In Bangladesh, um, in the temporary learning centres, um, although some of the strategies um, set out to engage um, a human rights approach, and um, particularly within the teaching methodologies, um, there was some evidence of this, um, and this had had impacts on um, reporting of bullying. Um, in most cases, the reality on the ground did not really equate, um, particularly due to, um, as Sylvia mentioned, the, the lack of um, teacher um, facilitator training. Um, it's worth noting here that um, both Jordan and Bangladesh are in um, quite different stages of their humanitarian response. Um, so in Jordan, Syrian refugees have been um, there for about a decade, um, since 2011. Um, and in Bangladesh, um, the refugees that we were working with, um, and the majority from Rohingya, have um, come much more recently in 2017. Um, so as Sylvia mentioned, there has been um, some positive change towards um, more inclusive um, education policies such as um, uh, introduction of the Myanmar curriculum, but um, unfortunately due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this was um, also paused. Um, so our findings, um, this research was conducted um, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this um, has also had a lot of um, implications um, on education access uh, for refugees. Um, so we have done some more research recently um, looking at the impacts um, of COVID on um, Syria and, um, Syrian and uh, Rohingya um, refugees' access to education. Um, thank you, Sylvia. I'll go on to the um, policy recommendations. Thank you. Um, 
So we made a number of um, recommendations um, for programmes um, working in humanitarian contexts. Um, so first, ensuring that um, programmes are properly resourced, um, particularly uh, with regards to um, facilitated training, um, as this was uh, quite a big difference uh, between Makani and the temporary learning centres. Um, the Makani facilitators had a lot more in-depth um, child protection training um, compared to the facilitators um, in Bangladesh. So each programme should also be um, appropriately adapted to each context. And where possible, um, they should promote social cohesion um, and try and encourage participants of different nationalities um, to work actively together um, during the programme. Finally, it's really important to ensure a safe environment um, so where participants feel safe to openly talk about um, their human rights, uh, potential rights, violations, um, and that there's really strong reporting mechanisms so they know um, where and how to report um, any potential rights violations. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've just put mine and Sylvia's um, context details um, on the final slide, um, and also the GAGE website if you wanted to um, check out any of our other research. Um, and our article is recently me put up on the um, Human Rights Education Review um, website. Thank you very much. Thank you both. That that has been a very um, knowledge rich and um, uh, intensive amount of information for people to take in. I can see we have one or two questions already appearing, but um, I also see that in our audience, we have many of our other um, writers, authors from uh, uh, Human Rights Education Review, from South Africa, from Nigeria, from Hong Kong, from Norway, Chile. So we've got a lot of experts in our in our audience here and it's really lovely to, to see you all. I would like just to kick off the questions by trying to see if there's any link between uh, these kind of programs and programs of targeting, targeting young people um, in uh, more stable communities, uh, mainstream communities, and to think about gender-based violence and, and child marriage these, these are issues that are not peculiar, of course, to, um, to refugee or migrant communities. They exist um, in both high income uh, uh, countries, sometimes uh, certainly the first and, and even child marriage can, can occur, but also in uh, conflict, as well as in conflict ridden societies and um, amongst all kinds of communities. And I wonder, when you're teaching about gender-based violence and, and child marriage, whether you know whether the teachers are using an explicit or implicit um, human rights framework, and whether you're noticing any difference in the take-up between boys and girls joining such programs, and how you said, you know, there's some very sensitive issues for some societies in Jordan, you talked about child marriage and gender-based violence perhaps being uh, problematic or taboo topics. So I wonder how you, if you know how they how these topics are presented to young people to encourage them to come along. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, those are very good points, I think. Um, when discussing the more sensitive topics, um, I think McCartney tries to, to use quite a, a range of, um, of methods to kind of um, create more open discussions um, with the participants. Um, so they particularly um, like to introduce role plays where um, they will be discussing um, a girl that's got married and it will talk through a story where kind of different um, shows the different experiences that she's had and uh, the kind of challenges that they that she faces um, and in that way it kind of opens up the discussion um, so that the adolescents can talk a bit more broadly about child marriage um, or things like sexual um, harassment without it kind of being directly linked to them it's a bit it's a bit more um, 
kind of um yeah broad um so i think also engaging with the parents is a really important um component to to these topics as well um because um often these particularly in terms of child marriage these decisions are not being made by the adolescents um so the importance um of engaging particularly with fathers who um in these cases will ultimately have um the kind of final decision um was seen as something kind of really important um uh, in tackling some of these issues um so in terms of take up with um boys and girls um so there was i'm not too sure about the exact take up if there was um a big difference but i think there has been some um some issues brought up by some adolescents um in terms of um the gender and social norms that are um held for most some girls in in the groups that they may not be able to participate as much in some of the programs um particularly i think in some of the more volunteering aspects of the programs um where they'd go out into the community um as i was mentioning in the innovation labs um there were some adolescents that were not able to do so um and those were mainly girls um due to kind of restrictive mobility um from their parents um sylvia is there anything you wanted to add um not not as much on on these themes in in the temporary learning centers um but uh, just to say that also in our research, these are themes we, we investigate. Um, as I said, we have an, an entire capability on bodily integrity and freedom from age and gender-based violence. And a strong component is that on, in that looks at child marriage. And we, um, as Megan mentioned, certainly in our virtual COVID research, but equally when we do face-to-face -face, uh, research, we um, try to uh, adapt our methodology to these very sensitive and delicate themes. So we may use vignettes um, as, a, as a qualitative research tool, which again would bring up a, a story uh, with characters that may, may have experienced child marriage. And we ask respondents to, uh, to respond to, to the storyline as opposed to talking about themselves. Um, and we feel that this, this creates a, a much more open dialogue and a non-threatening way to challenge social and gender norms and, and take a kind of uh, a deeper look into, into power dynamics that might be at play. And again, just to echo what Megan said, engaging parents and the broader community as well. So uh, religious leaders, community leaders, um, our other uh, certainly critical critical members uh, to to kind of foster gender transformative approaches thank you i think we have a question from elisa Mar marchi elisa are you there yes i'm here hi thank you for uh, this presentation and i have a question about how did you engage the broader community, so the broader uh, refugee community in particular to define the curriculum, uh, human rights curriculum, and also the uh, methodology? Uh, by the way, I, uh, I am based uh, in, uh, in the United States at the University of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so in terms of um, the curriculum, so um, this was um, done by UNICEF. So we're we're partnered with them and we're evaluating the program, but we're we're not actually running the program ourselves. So um, we weren't kind of involved in that aspect. But um, from what I know, there was um, quite a lot of kind of participatory approaches when designing um, the curriculum um, in terms of the human rights context. Um, and there was a lot of kind of discussion with um, with the communities and also a lot of their partners. Um, and the curriculum has kind of um, evolved a lot um, over time. I think when it started, um, Makani was more focused on um, education rather than the kind of wider 
life skills components. Um, this was mainly because at that time, um, Syrian refugees um, had a lot less access to formal education. Um, so they, um, it was a high number that didn't have access. Um, and during that time, um, the double shift system has expanded. So they've had um, a lot more access. So um, the Makani program also shifted to focusing more on the child protection and kind of life skills um, components. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, I, I don't have a, a whole lot of detail about um, how the curriculum was kind of, um, um, yeah, designed. Thank you. And we have a question um, uh, from Su Ming Ku. Um, yeah, okay, I'm based in the National University of Ireland. Um, so my question really, I suppose, is about the methodological constraint of the what works scenario when researching human rights. Because of course you've uh, produced excellent paper, really good research on you know, how programs have gone in a comparative sense with quite large samples, qualitative, quantitative, really methodologically sound. But this is really constrained, I think, by the what works idea, which is about con comparing what works between programs. But it seems really striking to me in the results that you have shown really is uh, the massive difference between the right to have rights at all that refugee uh, young people may or may not enjoy, um, which is the, the fundamental precondition for having any experience of rights at all. So I suppose that my, you know, it's a bit of a leading question and maybe not very fair, but yeah, I wonder if really what you're comparing is not what works in the educational interventions or programs as such, but actually comparing different levels of exclusion from citizenship and exclusion from the very right to have rights that are accorded to young learners in the two very different settings. Thank you. Megan, or do you want to respond or Sylvia? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that is a is a good, um, a really good point. Um, yeah, it'd be good to hear also from Sylvia um, from this because, um, but I think particularly the Bangladesh side does kind of um, highlight the the kind of levels of exclusion and um, the inability for them to access their rights. Um, and I think, yeah, um, looking at these two programs, you can kind of. Um, see maybe what the potential could be for the Bangladesh um, non-formal program um, in the future and um, as I said they are both kind of quite different in levels of their response so um, yeah it was it was a good point a comment and something to definitely think about um, but Sylvia was there something you wanted to add from the Bangladesh side? Yes, no, fully, fully, um, fully agree with the point. Um, and the level of, of exclusion, um, non-citizenship, um, the in the Rohingya case, um, as I mentioned, they are a stateless population. So uh, very easy to fall between the cracks of, of policy um, and, um, and humanitarian kind of uh, spaces. That, that being said, yes, I think um, there would be a whole lot more to say on, on our base. This was a baseline research. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in some of the other capability domains, um, the, the findings are very, very stark. So we've found that the Rohingya, when they essentially reach um, puberty for girls, especially, um, they are even more so marginalized, even more kind of silenced. Um, they have to uh, often, often remain kind of indoors, full stop, uh, so they, they don't have a chance to go to school or to work. Things are seem to potentially be changing in Bangladesh with some volunteering opportunities in the camps, uh, but the level of exclusion is, um, is absolutely uh, very, very much a presence in their lives. And, um, and as I say, in some of the other capability domains, this comes out very strongly as well. So the ability, the inability to exercise their voice and agency um, is, another, is another aspect that we look at, absolutely. But, but yeah, I agree with Megan that this is a critical point. 
we have quite a lot of people wanting to speak and very little time left. I wonder if um, uh, Mohammed Karul Islam from Bangladesh can ask a question very straightforwardly. I think um, there should be, I imagine there's going to be a quite direct response. Um, um, Karul, are you there? Bangladesh? Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, could you hear me? Could you hear yes. me? Go ahead. Yeah. We're not hearing you. I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. I just, I would like to share this. I'm going to repeat uh, Carol's uh, question. Uh, his question is, this kind of research is challenging in terms of getting approval and data collection in Bangladesh. Can you please share your experiences of that? Was it difficult to get permission to do this research? And if not, why not? Very briefly. Yeah, very briefly. So as I um, mentioned in, in terms of just the gauge methodology, so we work um, exclusively, I would say, with uh, with local partners. So in Bangladesh, we partnered with um, with IPA, um, as well as uh, researchers from Chittagong University, who certainly um, being being obviously in, in Bangladesh and, and in the Chittagong case very close to, to Cox's Bazaar, um, certainly facilitated all of the necessary approvals um, and ethical clearances that were required. So, uh, so we didn't have um, we didn't have too much of a challenging time. But again, we rely on on local expertise. Thank you. I'm going to rush now through other questions just to say we have um, a question from Jay Sell. Uh, is child marriage inevitably forced marriage? I think we could have a debate about that, but I don't think we've got time to address that one. But maybe that's something that you can continue after the, um, the session. And we have one very quickly, please, from John Bedoya in uh, Colombia. Uh, okay, hello, how are you? Fine. Nice, okay. And I'm talking about the situation uh, here in Colombia. We have immigrants. Uh, they are from Venezuela. Maybe the difference, the big difference is that they uh, were more assimilated to the educational context. Uh, we have them in our district schools. Uh, they have the same language. So we see, we see that it's uh, easier here to work with these uh, kids, but the situation there is absolute, absolute uh, discrimination. So I see that work very challenging but I appreciate it because for us it's easier. We have the children, maybe the same situation as the Colombian ones, but there is quite, quite difficult. So I appreciate and admire that work. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, if you have other questions, there are new messages appearing now. I'm sorry that we can't take any more. I'm going to turn to Hugh, who I know also had a question about knowledge and about uh, the content of human rights, and that relates to our next session. So I'm turning to Hugh now to close. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Sophia and, and Megan, for a terrific presentation. Well, wonderful slides, actually, a, a model of, of how to do a, a PowerPoint pre presentation that makes it so easy for us to, to follow. Um, in the chat, you have got a reminder um, the next uh, the, the next session for this is with Walter Parker, which is why um, I asked uh, in the chat a question about knowledge because his topic is um, human rights education's curriculum problem. He's actually talking about human rights education's knowledge problem. We're, we're very good at creating uh, spaces that are rights respecting. Um, but perhaps less um, advanced in actually determining what knowledge uh, we, we are, what, what, what the, 
the actual curriculum is in terms of what, what we uh, expect students to learn. So um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the registration is, is now open for uh, the, the next seminar. I, I think uh, Walter Parker is a very well-known um, name. It's on the 17th of March, um, 16.30 again, one hour. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. We've had about 55 people actually attend today. So that's uh, more than we had last time. I think we're, we're building up um, a, a following for uh, this seminar series. And uh, uh, please tell your friends about um, how interesting uh, the, and, and worthwhile these uh, seminars are uh, and invite them to, to register. Thank you again, Megan and Sylvia. Thank you, Audrey, for, for chairing. And uh, uh, goodbye for now. And looking forward to seeing you on the 17th of March. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much.